it's operational technology or also called as industrial control system. Uh, so again, to give an example of that, uh, we can say uh, the electricity that comes to your home, uh, the food and gas uh, that comes to your home, uh, to the water that comes to your home. Uh, if you talk about all these critical sectors, there are around 14 critical sectors where you, you can find this industrial control systems present. So that is what OT is all about. So I've worked across various sectors uh, throughout my career. Uh, being, being into pharma sector, automobile, oil and gas. And I've also worked across various domains uh, from the IT and OT, I can say. It be it be endpoint security, be it be network, be it be application security, governance, SOC operations, and the latest ones, cloud security. As Gurmi sir highlighted, I have few, done few active certifications throughout my career. The latest one is the IC 62443 cybersecurity certificate. As uh, sir has already told you, uh, it consists of four different, uh, we can say, courses or certificates that you need to do after which you get an expert kind of an tag. Apart from that, I'm also in CISSP, CISM, ISO 27001, and CCSK. I'm, I'm an active member on various social forums, so please feel to connect with me. Uh, I'm happy to share and learn uh, because I believe uh, if, if there is an hunger within you to learn, that's how you grow. Uh, and also an active member of IC Pune chapter also uh, with all these other global forums that I'm connected. Uh, as highlighted by sir, I'm currently working with one of the leading food and beverage industry in Pune. Uh, we can say across the globe, Tetra Pak India Private Limited. I'm working here as an OT security architect. And I'm also proudly like to say that we are the world leading single source manufacturers and suppliers of complete solutions, equipments and consumable for processing and packaging of ice creams across the globe. So you can imagine people who are not aware, just to give a small uh, example of Tetra Pak. Uh, so if you go into any uh, food malls or any street malls, uh, the uh, specifically the, uh, we can say the fruits uh, and the juices that you get, uh, the good examples can be the Amul or the Fruity. Uh, so these are the packs that are being made from Tetra Paks and also the equipments uh, that are being used are being shared by Tetra Pak. So moving to my next slide. Just a short disclaimer uh, before we start the session. Uh, the opinions are my own and not the views of my employer, which I've been affiliated now or in my past career. Uh, the material information contained in my presentation is for general information purpose only. And just then one more, uh, we can say disclaimer, which I have not added it here. Uh, as, as, as it has been raining heavily from last uh, two more days across Maharashtra, I believe uh, there will be few kind of a lags within my talk. So just bear with me if, if there is any log, uh, I will try to switch on my connections if, if there are any lags that are observed. So now let's talk about the session. Uh, yeah, so I believe the human beings are good in storytelling. So I would also like to tell you a small story, uh, we can say based on real facts that happened two and a half years back. Uh, it was the COVID time, uh, we, we all have experienced that time and we, we all know how that situation was across the globe. So that was the time when uh, this was the kind of incident that happened with my past organization, which I will be taking you across kind of a short agenda. What exactly happened? Uh, kind of a recap of that particular day with the various timelines that are put it across. Then we'll move uh, into the shoes of a cyber forensic analyst, what exactly forensic evidence were being gathered during that entire incident investigation. The existing gaps that we found out from a technical perspective, the lessons learned from that particular incident and and few of the takeaways uh, for the people who have joined today. Uh, maybe uh, uh, you can take this kind of a learnings to your organization to the various controls that we cross check. And lastly, I will be also talking about how this 62443 expert certification is helping in my career career. Uh, and at the last, we will have the Q&A session. So uh, I will request all of you to be on mute. And uh, if you have any questions, just make a note of those and we can discuss those during the Q&A session. So moving to my next slide, uh, as I said, uh, now let's go back two and a half years from now. Uh, it was October, 2020. Uh, so if you see on the left-hand side of me, Dr. Reddy, one of the global known uh, name within the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and I've highlighted a few, we can say liners here uh, with an yellow color so that you can just focus on those. So 22nd October, uh, that was the day uh, that uh, uh, we can see Dr. Reddy, one of the name, uh, ransomware attack. 
and if you see uh, it was been though it was been declared on 28 uh, we know now due to this uh, working on a lot of medicines uh, during this covid time that was the time which has been chosen by the hackers also the threat actors to target pharmaceutical industries across the globe and that was the time period when dr reddy got hit october 2020 uh, 22nd october was the day and if you move on the right hand side, that was the firm that I was working with. It of time. So if you see 22nd of October and uh, our organization got hit on 30th of October. So I still remember that day uh, very clear, uh, we can say, because it was just after an weeks, uh, uh, we get the similar incident happening to another pharmaceutical firm. Uh, so that that was happening to us. And uh, we, though it was also into news uh, with, on 7th of November, that it was it came to news. Moving to my next slide. So now going back to that uh, entire uh, Vikasa incident, uh, taking you back to that particular day. So 30th of October, as I said, was the day. Uh, so if you see the timelines that I've put it across, 27th, uh, 22nd October was the day when Dr. Reddy, one of the well-known firm got hit. And 30th of October, uh, the organization that I was working. So just to give a background regarding my organization, Again, one of the, uh, we can say, top 10 leading pharmaceutical firms within India, uh, having around 20,000 odd employees across the globe and 15 plus manufacturing plants. So just imagine uh, the kind of a setup or infra or employees that this organization has in the back end. And it, it is not uncommon nowadays that uh, organizations are getting hit via this kind of a cyber incident. So as I've highlighted, 30th of October, uh, around 2 a.m., that was the time when uh, the AD, uh, which stands for Active Directory. So people who are not familiar with Active Directory, uh, this is kind of an, uh, we can say, uh, for identity and authorization within any organization. Active Directories are the servers, uh, we can say, uh, which are being used for those identity and access management. So around 30th of October, 2 a.m., that was the time when our AD servers, uh, we can say, were having and sync with the other AD servers across the plant locations. So we were having some kind of an parent and child architecture where the parent, uh, we can say, was uh, within the data center, the active directory. And that active directory was to have and sync with other active directories across the plant locations after 2 a.m. So that was the time which has been chosen by the threat actors also because they, uh, during that entire analysis phase, they know that that was the time when this active directory, the parent one, would sync up with their child directories. And that time, uh, when it started syncing across the plant location, we started facing issues related to identity and access management. So if you see uh, on the above one, 3.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, I getting a call from one of my IT manager from the data center. Uh, first, first as, as it was very early morning, uh, uh, I missed that first call. But again, within a five or 10 minutes of call, uh, he again called me back. And I understood that is something that has gone wrong. And being in person, uh, we can say wearing multiple hats within an organization where I was also supporting the SOC operations uh, and point of contact from and security, uh, I, I got involved into that call. So he asked me to join the call. And uh, I, I can literally say that around 3.30, 3.45 a.m. when I jumped into that call, it was kind of an 40 to 50 people from various technical departments within the organization, the management joined into that call. And just imagine uh, the kind of an havoc situation that happens. Everybody is just trying to identify what exactly has happened because there was no authentication, no authorization that was been happening in the back end. And everybody was just trying to figure out what exactly is being going. And uh, if, if you really go to that situation, then you can really understand the pain because you do not know the root cause and you're just trying to find out in the various ways that you can to find out what's the exact reason for this kind of a havoc situation that has happened. So if you move down uh, the next timeline, 4.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, we got a call, uh, we can say, from one of our global locations, Mexico. Uh, the local IT manager called us back and he confirmed us that they are seeing a ransomware message onto their screens. So people who are familiar uh, with ransomware, just to give you a background, it's it's kind of a malware that encrypts your entire hard disk or entire systems. Uh, your entire data has been getting encrypted, and you get a pop-up screen on your systems saying that your entire data has been encrypted, 
and now you need to pay and ransom and they they uh, the usually uh, hackers share a message uh, asking back to connect to them via some email or something that you need to connect back to have the decryption keys so around 4:30 am now it was very clear that we had a ransomware incident and it started propagating across the plant locations so people who are been familiar with a manufacturing plant uh, can understand the pain when such kind of an uh, uh, situation happens where when there is no authentication or authorization happening the kind of a havoc situation that happens across the plant locations also because we have machines that are been running 24 by 7 and then if such kind of an issue is happening uh, it, it it's a real pain to the people on the productions also so uh, at 4:30 am it was been confirm, uh, confirmed that it was a ransomware incident and the similar kind of a message started uh, propagating across the plant locations of my firm also so as i said having 15 plus manufacturing plants similar kind of a messages started getting on the screens uh, of this manufacturing people also specifically into manufacturing if you talk about the windows based systems uh, which as per the purdue model or as per the network level uh, we can say uh, the level 3.5 or level uh, 3.5 and above are the windows based devices specifically uh, within an ot environment within a manufacturing so that were the systems which got first hit and they also started seeing that ransomware message going to my next timeline so around 5 am uh, it was lucky enough that uh, i can say uh, two weeks before this incident happening to our organization uh, and the kind of a news that were been going across uh, within the internet world also seeing ransomware kind of an events uh, we were lucky enough to have a third party incident response so ir stands for incident response here so that was the team uh, we can say that we hired from a third party to do kind of an forensic analysis so uh, these are the teams that get involved when any such kind of an incident happens to an organization to do kind of an incident investigation so we were lucky enough uh, for me to convince to my procurement team also uh where they were already saying that we have something called as a cyber insurance in place uh but people who are not aware uh, i will talk about that cyber insurance flaw also uh, within my next slide uh how that is also in flaw uh, though we say we have a cyber insurance in place uh but yeah we were lucky enough to have the third party uh, incident response service and they got involved and within one hours of time i can say that they were able to identify uh, we we took a remote system of the maxico location and they took an entire uh, the, we can say registry dump where they identified the exact script so it was kind of a script that was been put across within our ad servers and that was been shared across the shared drives also so they were able to identify the exact malware script that was been inserted within the active directory server and within one hour of time i can say that uh, we were able to identify the root cause but till that time, uh, if you say uh, where the AD server has already synced across the plant locations, there are already systems which got infected via that. So uh, people who are really familiar regarding a ransomware incident, if something gets encrypted onto your system, uh, you only have a chance to, uh, 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 we can say, format that entire system to rebuild it again and then to restore all your software, all your data if you have in backups. So though it was in short, short period that we identified the root cause, the entire containment activity, I can say it really took a long time. And uh, if I, if I, if I re want to really, uh, uh, we can say speak on that point, uh, to bring our business back to normal, it, it literally took us more than 20 to 25 days, working days, I can say, to bring our business back to normal as it was been be behaving before the incident. Moving on to my next slide. Now let's get into the shoes of a cyber forensic analyst. So now let's understand from a cyber forensic, uh, we can say analyst, what exactly were the key findings uh, where they started doing this kind of a forensic investigation. Uh, so as I said, uh, we involved that third party who was able to identify that root cause. Uh, but again, there, uh, as I said, there is a clause uh, where we say uh the cyber in insurance people they require and uh, and big four specifically i do not know the reason why really and big four has been required so people who are not familiar with big four uh these are usually the big names into consulting uh like the ey uh we can say pwc deloitte and the kpmg so these are called specifically the big fours so that was kind of a requirement from the cyber insurance company also where we uh, connected back 
saying that you need to do this kind of an investigation via a big four company. So now let's understand uh, what exactly happened from a cyber forensics perspective, the various evidences that they gathered. So if you see the first timeline, again, 1st of October, uh, I just put a rough timeline here. So it was been said that before one month itself. So if you see the timeline, 30th of October was the final stroke that happened. But before that, the threat actors were there within our organization doing their recon phase. So it's not kind of an hard and fast that such kind of incidents happen to an organization. These threat actors, uh, these threat actors uh, remain into your organization for a longer time. And before your soft teams, anyone detecting that. So if you see the first timeline, uh, uh, first of October, a phishing mail hitting one of our procurement team member. And we all know, though we put a number of technical controls, uh, people, I believe, uh, are at the weakest link and also the line of defense, I, I can say, where uh, uh, such mails hit to their e email boxes and people, uh, we can say, allude to click on those mails. So this phishing mail hit our procurement team member and he, he clicked that particular mail and where he submitted his credentials. So that was the entry point for the threat actors uh, where now they already have these credentials. Uh, we can say active directory credentials of that person, genuine person within the organization. And that was the key entry point for the threat actors to get within our organization. The second timeline that I put it across, uh, they had access to the VDI environment. So people who are not fa familiar what exactly VDI is, VDI is nothing but a virtual desktop environment. So uh, as, as I told, it was in COVID time, uh, people were really having and concerns going to offices and all. So every organization started giving such kind of an environment, uh, laptops to their employees to work from home, right? So that was the situation where we are not allowed to go to offices, not allowed to go to plants. And uh, also, also due to the shortage of electrical equipment, laptops, uh, we can say it was not very easy to provide laptops or desktops to every employee. So that was the time uh, where our infrastructure team has set up something called as a virtual desktop environment. So it is just an URL that you need to access by your normal desktop systems. And by which when you enter your credentials, you get into a virtual desktop environment of the organization. So that was also the environment as, as, it, as it has been set up onto a cloud environment. Uh, it was easy for the hackers to find it out. And that was then the entry point used by the hackers to get into the organization. So if you if you connect these chains, uh, now they already have the credentials. They know oh, the virtual environment which has been set up by my organization to get into the organization. So once they use those credentials, they are now already into my organization's infrastructure. So once these hackers are into the organization, they start doing a lot of recon phase. So recon is nothing but doing a lot of analysis, uh, trying to find out the various network paths, the various critical systems that are there within an organization. So that entire analysis has been done during the initial phases by the threat actors. And I can literally say that they really remain calm across the, we can say, uh, activities uh, so that there is nothing uh, gets alarmed to your SOC teams. Going to the next timeline, uh, now when they are already within our Active Directory, uh, when they are already within my VDI environment, they started running various scripts uh, to fetch the Active Directory dump data. So as I said, Active Directory, one of the critical piece, uh, which is used by identity and access management uh, within every organization, uh, they somehow try to get and dump of that entire Active Directory. So when I say dump, uh, it is the credential hashes, uh, which is in hashes, uh, that dump data was, they were able to get that. And by getting that data, they were able to identify the key admin credentials. So when we say uh, key admin credentials, now when we already have the keys to a kingdom, it's it's easy for an hacker to go across the network to find the various critical resources. So it was been said that they already had the key credentials for the AD, uh, we can say AD accounts specifically. Uh, and they started doing the network recon. Uh, that's been highlighted into the 6th to 12th of October. When we say an entire recon, they identify the key critical servers within your environment, uh, how the online uh, or offline backups are being set up within the environment. Because uh, because before hitting some kind of a ransomware attack, 
they also make sure or if if you are having some something kind of as an online backup they try to corrupt those backups also so similar was the case within our organization they corrupted the entire online backup before playing that final stop so going to the next timeline uh, they tested few scripts we can say the script that they were working uh, it was believed that they tested that script onto the redundant active directory server so people who are familiar within every organization, it's not a single server, uh, but from a redundancy per perspective, it's active and backup servers that are being laid off. So they do not uh, tested those script on the active active directory server, but they tested it on the redundant active directory server. That was also been found during that entire analysis phase. So now they already tested that script. They know that what are the kind of an, uh, things that would go wrong. So they verified that, they corrected that and they place those scripts across the shared folders so within every organization uh, there are common drives that are being used across to store data so that that was all again the common path that has been used by the hackers also because they, that is something uh, they do not introduce new within your organization they use the existing uh, tools existing uh, shared drives kind of a thing to uh, deploy their scripts across the organization so moving to the next timeline, uh, when I say uh, they were there within the entire network doing that entire recon, uh, understanding the various manufacturing plants that we had across the globe, the critical systems into that. So now uh, I can I can we can say that the hackers or the threat actors were having an entire uh, overview of our entire organization, which were the critical online servers available, which were the critical manufacturing plants uh, across the globe, uh, which would have a really impact. Uh, because uh, production being going on across those plants. And it was been said that uh, on the 29th of October, late evening India time. Guys, uh, if you can be on mute, that would be really helpful for me. Yes, we have a Please put yourself on mute. Yeah, would be happy. Milin specifically, I can see that uh, his mic was unmuted. Okay. Moving to my last, uh, so on 29th of October, that was the final time when they played that final stroke. Uh, and uh, as we said, uh, 2 a.m. was the time midnight when this Active Directory server started uh, propagating across the thinking across the other Active Directory servers. So that was the time the impact was more as uh, the script, uh, the malware script was already synced across the locations. But it was also, we were also lucky enough, I can say that, because uh, it was an, a very uh, early morning time. So most of the end users uh, from end users perspective were not online. So they were not being infected that much. But yes, I can, I can uh, surely say that the servers uh, were being impacted more. So we will talk about those into my detailed analysis. Hope you are uh, you understood that entire cyber key chain. What exactly happened? How the threat actors were able to get into the network and how they use the existing infrastructure to do all that recon phase to do all that network reconnaissance and then to play their final script or final we can say stroke uh, to cause an incident. Going to my next screen. So now let's understand from an uh, we can say technical perspective. Uh, Though we say organizations have a lot of technical controls put in, uh, why these threat actors were able to bypass those, or we can say they were able to uh, be present into that network without anything getting highlighted or flagged off. So I've listed across the first gap, social engineering. So if you see across cyber incidents that happen across the globe, social engineering is one of the top, we can say, method that has been used by the cyber threat actors where they make many we can say uh, fishy emails and those mails have been sent across to the employees and when we say uh, employees they do a lot of recon on the internet also i believe uh, if you if you really want to target an organization we can just do a linkedin search or a facebook search and we can know all the employees that are being connected to that organization so that is also the uh, social thing that has been used by the threat actors to target any organization and people being the weakest link uh, and the, we can say the line of defense are the ones who are being targeted first. So though we put an N number of technical controls, again, and phishing mail, if it get bypassed through your technical controls, uh, that, that can easily get delivered to your end employee. 
and if an end employee is really not aware uh, he, he can click that link and his credentials can be compromised so that was the similar uh, mechanism that has been used in our case social engineering where the employee's credentials got compromised second virtual desktop environment as i said as it was in covid high time uh, the infrastructure team wanted to make sure all those employees working from home are connected to our backend uh, they were able to work so at that time they did not made sure the security team was involved uh, where when they were setting up this infrastructure virtual infrastructure environment and security uh, team to review that entire thing that everything from a security uh, is been put in place so that was not done in our case that was the second gap major gap because that was uh, the kind of an uh, root entry uh, by using those credentials and using that environment to do an uh, recon of the entire organization was being used by the threat actors going to third one av solution uh, it's antivirus nothing but so we all know organizations put across various antivirus uh, agents on our systems but it was also observed that uh, the vdi environment that was been set up it was not having an endpoint protection and also if you talk about when i said uh, the major impacting uh, thing was on the server side uh, the servers uh, specifically that we had uh, there were two features i can specifically point out those specific features uh, there are ips engines uh, where uh, it's, it's nothing but an intrusion prevention engine uh, within that antivirus that prevents such kind of an attacks but yes uh, that particular engine was also been disabled on few of the servers and apart from that uh, organizations usually have something called as a locking system where they lock that endpoint with an password so that if someone is trying to tamper that endpoint on the server uh, they will be prompted with an password but I can, I can say that that was also one of the concern uh, where across the servers, that particular feature was not being enabled where most of the servers got it infected. So when we say, uh, though we have effective solutions put in place or technical controls put in place, how effective are those controls on the ground really matters to every organization. So that is the kind of a review also I would suggest when you take back uh, lessons learned from this entire session. Going to the fourth point, a backup solution. Uh, as I told, uh, though we were having online backups, uh, the hackers are also able to identify that and they corrupted that entire online backups. So when I say uh, corrupted, uh, they use a lot of uh, malware and other things so that they can uh, corrupt that entire hard disk so that you can never use that backup that you are having online. So when such kind of a ransomware incident happens, the first thing that organizations do is they try to restore the data they, that they have in their online backups. So that's the factor that threat actors also know. And uh, they also try to corrupt that entire backups, online backups that have been available so that we cannot use that online backups. Fifth pointer, MFA. Uh, this is nothing but multi-factor authentication. Uh, people who are not familiar, uh, nowadays Microsoft or any apps that you use, they have an uh, multi-factor authentication. It, it may be in terms of an app, uh, authenticator app or it may be kind of an OTP password that comes to you. So people who will be using their banking applications also, we have this MFA been enabled by the banking applications. Uh, but in our case, uh, uh, as uh, this MFA also comes with a cost. So people who are not familiar with Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, has an E2 and above license uh, that needs to be taken if you really want to have this kind of a feature. So though we were having that features on the admin people or the IT people who were serving the entire infrastructure, that multi-factor authentication was been not pushed across all the employees. So that was also the reason that uh, in the first, if you remember, uh, the credentials of the procurement person being used by the threat actor, there was no multi-factor authentication. Because if there would have been a multi-factor authentication, they would have not compromised its account itself. But yes. As I said, uh, it comes with their own cost. So that was also in kind of a concern. Uh, and from an admin's perspective, uh, uh, one of the concerns that came across while the cyber forensic analysis also, uh, it was been said that one of our admin guy was on vacation. Okay. And we all know we, we people being on vacation, we usually do not like to answer any calls uh, if, if they are coming from the offices. And I believe though in India, we, we, we try to answer those calls, but I believe if you talk about European culture, if they are on vacations, they are on vacations. They would not entertain any calls, uh, any personal messages. So that's how it is. Uh, though one of the admin guy, uh, he got a lot of MFA alerts 
on his system he never highlighted back to the soft team so uh, the security operations team that sits within our organization uh, in case of any such incident happens so he they were never been alerted uh, when uh, uh, when i say the threat actors were already using those admin credentials to move across within my network sixth pointer here legacy operating system so people who are familiar with uh, we can say critical infrastructure or manufacturing windows xp windows 7 are still common across those environments if you still go within an plant uh, you will find this kind of an systems which are still running uh, i can still remember uh, one of the session that i was attending uh, i believe there was a person from sec cement uh, and uh, he just gave an example that uh, one of his plant which has been running more than 60 to 70 years can you imagine the kind of an operating system that plant would be that plant system should be having i believe it will be before my birth also or most of your births also but those plants are still running currently also so they are still running on few of the older operating system which has been supported i can say uh, not not that older but i can say below windows 2000 uh, below windows xp also the people who are familiar with the older operating systems they they are legitimate in few of the manufacturing plants if you go on the shop floor so windows 7 windows xp is still one of the common one and uh, i can also say that uh, within the mexico location that was the first to get hit across within our uh, we can say global organization they were also having few uh, we can say laptops which were running on windows 7 which were the first ones to get encrypted moving to my next point uh, SOC. Uh, so SOC is nothing but a security operations center uh, so when i see the entire change there was no alert that was been raised across to my SOC. Uh, and I just missed uh, the ransomware name. It was Sodi Nokibi. That was the malware family. Uh, you can just Google it out. So this is one of the famous, uh, we can say malware families within ransomware, Sodi Nokibi. That was the one that targeted our organization. So there were no alerts uh, within the SOC team also uh, that was been highlighted. And lastly, the incident response. So people from an organization would understand uh, incident response is nothing but if such kind of an incident happens to an organization, there are various third party teams or internal teams uh, which are being involved to do an entire forensic analysis of what exactly happened, how these threat actors got into an organization and what are the various tools and techniques that they use. Going to my next slide, hope I'm not too fast, not too slow. Uh, I'm just trying to build up a picture for you guys what exactly happened. What were the technical gaps that were being exploited by the threat actors groups? And now let's move to the lessons learned. So when we talk about lessons learned backup solution, the first one, uh, we all know offline backups uh, uh, plays a major role. Uh, but again, uh, if, you, if you talk about online and offline backups, it comes with their own cost. So if you are having offline backups also, you need to store that uh, within, uh, we can say external hard drive or ex external drives and that that you need to keep it at a separate location so it depends upon the organization if they are really having something very critical uh, then only they plan for those offset backups uh, but in our in our case we were lucky enough uh, that across our plant locations the major systems uh, manufacturing systems were literally having that offline backups so that were been used across to restore that data so but uh, coming from a technical perspective people who are familiar with an restoration process uh, an organization needs to have a restoration process in place because if you talk about if you are never restored your data that you are taken into your hard disk and if you really want to restore that data in in kind of an such kind of an ransomware event sometimes that data may be also corrupted or it, you may be not able to recover that entire data that you are taken and backups so organizations usually have this uh, restoration policies also where if they are taking something offside backups, they restore that data and those kind of validation checks have been done. So that was one of the first lesson learned. Uh, though we had, uh, we can say online backup that has been corrupted. Uh, we had a few offline backups, but yes, a uh, few of the offline backups were not restored and tested. So that failed during that restoration process. And when I say uh, it, it took more than 20 to 25 days uh, for that entire business to come normal, that was also one of the reason. Uh, because when, when the plant locations were trying to restore from that offline data, they were not able to do so. 
Moving to the second point of incident response services. Uh, so that really plays a major role across the organizations because sometimes organizations do not have the resources, do not have the technical people who really know what exactly needs to be done in such kind of an incident. Because it was also the similar kind of a situation for us uh, when, when the first call that we got and we went jump into that call, it was kind of a havoc situation. Though, though we write a lot of procedures and policies, uh, when such kind of incident happens, uh, people really forget those that they really have something in the back end and they need to follow those steps uh, in terms of communication, in terms of restoration activities, in terms of uh, doing containment activities. So that is usually be playing a key role. So incident response services or an incident response playbooks also. Nowadays, organizations have a lot of playbooks where they do kind of a mock drills, kind of an, uh, we can say, uh, test drives of what exactly they have documented. And if such kind of an incident happened, uh, whether they can do the similar kind of steps. Going to the third point of the AV solution, uh, though I say uh, that uh, organizations put a lot of technical controls, how effective are those controls put on the ground really matters to an organization. As I highlighted in our case, though we had an antivirus, uh, we can say protection for the servers, the password protection, the IPS engine was been disabled. So that plays a key role because though your solution is providing that uh, kind of a feature, uh, organizations maybe due to their own reasons, they disable that features. They do not use the full fledged, uh, we can say effective use of that solution because they, these are the ones that are being exploited by the threat actors. The fourth point, uh, uh, new solutions project. Uh, so it is also recommended that wherever uh, within an organization, any, any new uh, infrastructure or projects are being set up, it is always best preferred to have security teams also involved uh, to do those kind of uh, security reviews. Because they've been the security people, they can literally make you understand what are the kind of threats that you uh, have within your organization that can be exploited by a third party. MFA, uh, as I rightly said, uh, it comes with their own cost. So it's again a management decision that it depends that if you are really planning for an MFA kind of a feature from Microsoft, you need to have some kind of a licensing in the back end and every license comes with an own cost. So that is also the reason when organizations plan to have such kind of an features, uh, they also check the kind of an uh, return on investment uh, when they are putting such kind of an investment into any solution. Cyber insurance, uh, as I talked about, uh, I believe uh, that also played a key role. Though our organization had a cyber insurance in the back end, uh, I can literally say that because I was also doing a follow up with the cyber insurance team. There is a lot of documentation that you need to supply back to the insurers. So it is the similar kind of an insurance that comes to uh, the medical insurance that we have. It is a similar kind of a thing coming with a star mark kind of a conditions applied. So that is also the similar case. Uh, uh, we can say situation in our case, though we had an X amount of we can say uh, cyber insurance that we had taken uh, the last as per my last knowledge, uh, that was not the entire amount that was been refunded by the or been reimbursed by the uh, cyber insurance company. It was just 60 to 80 percent that was been reversed back. And again, that too took more than a one years of time to have that insurance amount credited into the organization. So just imagine, though we say uh, from a risk perspective that we are doing a risk transfer, taking some kind of a cyber insurance. Uh, nowadays, cyber insurance companies also do a lot of checks, like uh, checking what are the technical controls you have put in place before uh, assuring you some kind of an insurance amount. The second point, uh, seventh pointer is the EDR. EDR is nothing but endpoint detection and response. Uh, that also played a key role within our organization. Uh, we were not having a central, we can say, solution which can detect and do and response activities. So after this particular incident, yeah, uh, it was kind of a lesson learned for us. And that was also one of the feedbacks from the big four also doing that entire cyber forensic analysis. Uh, they have asked us to have an EDR kind of a solution to do incident detection and response. IR playbooks, uh, this play a major role. Uh, I believe that is also a learning uh, from this entire incident. Now, organization needs to have this kind of an incident response playbooks. So playbooks are nothing but uh, we can say if, if such kind of an incident happens to an organization, what are the various steps that that organization can do? And now organizations needs to do and drill kind of an activities. So people who are from organizations here joined, uh, they would have seen 
Now cyber drills, similar to the safety fire drills that happens to our organization. Uh, now cyber drills also happens, like if a cyber incident is happening, what are the various teams that would get involved and what are the various kind of an actions or communications that would be done by that various teams. Business continuity. So people who have been familiar with business continuity, uh, uh, it's been called as an BCP also, uh, business continuity planning uh, that has been done by the organization. That plays a vital role. But if you talk about uh, specifically the RTO and RPO that I've listed it across, uh, it's nothing but uh, in technical terms, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. So to explain you in layman words, uh, it, it's the, uh, we can say time uh, before which you can have the data backed up or what is the accurate data that would be available if such kind of an incident happened. So in our case, when I said uh, we were totally dependent on the online backups, and when that data got corrupted uh, and this business, uh, we can see the BCP uh, business continuity, which has been planned on based on that online data, like uh, a critical application would be backed up uh, or we can be restored back within four hours or eight hours of time that literally took more time than expected. So that is where the business, uh, we can say BCP values also needs to be calculated. If you are really depending totally on the online backups, you need to also consider the offline backups. If uh, those uh, restoration activities are been tested out, what is the usual time that it takes to restore uh, data from an offline backup? So that was also one of the reason uh, when I said uh, it took more than 20 to 25 days for bringing b business back to normal uh, because that time was not been calculated while doing these business continuity activities. And the last one was the communication. Uh, so we would like to highlight here. Uh, now, major of the organizations across the globe have these timelines that if any such cyber incident happens to an organization, we need to report back to the government agencies to the certain. So within India, we have something called as uncertain. So if such kind of an incident happens to any listed company within India, uh, that is a timeline of, I believe, 72 hours, less than 72 hours, that you need to report back to the government of India, to the various certain uh, bodies. And it is not only within India, uh, across the globe also, uh, the new needs to uh, regulatory requirement that has been coming across. Or if you talk about the SEC, uh, there is a new regulatory requirement from uh, within US also. They have similar kind of an reporting timelines. So it's across uh, now the globe, I can say, when any such cyber incident happens to an organization, there is a timeline within which you need to re reply back to these government bodies, inform them back. You need to inform your, uh, we can say, stakeholders also in that case. So that is where this communication really matters. So these are the kind of lessons learning. If you have uh, any questions, uh, just make a note of that so that we can talk about those during the Q&A session. Moving to my next slide. So these are the kind of an, uh, learnings or key takeaways for me. I try to divide it into four, uh, three phases, A, B, and C, because people, uh, as I said, telling a story, uh, A, B, and C is easy to remember, right? A being awareness. So though, as I say, we have a number of technical controls that we put in play, uh, employee awareness or people awareness literally plays a major role within every organization, not only within the professional life. Nowadays, awareness is also been required within your personal lives also. So just to give an example, I believe uh, people uh, who have joined this call would be also familiar with various kind of an cyber frauds that are happening nowadays. So not only into your personal life, you, you can also get such kind of an phishing emails. Uh, we can say our SMS or links uh, that you need to be aware uh, before you click on that link and something getting compromised, your credentials getting compromised or your system or uh, we can say handheld device getting compromised. So awareness plays a major role uh, with your personal as well as with your professional lives. B uh, stands for budget. Uh, so literally, uh, I would I would like to give a suggestion uh, to all the people who have joined, especially for the industrial professionals. Budget plays an important role. It's not the technical hat that you need to wear where you present those kind of an concerns to your management. You need to wear the business hat uh, when you do those kind of a discussion with your management team. Make them understand from a brand reputation perspective, from a safety operations perspective, the kind of a different concerns that this kind of a cyber incidents can have to an organization. And then you can have your budgets approved. I can also like to highlight a fact here, uh, though I can say it, it was also a lesson learning. Uh, I, have, I, have, I was also been involved within the IT budget within my lost organization. 
I can know, uh, I can, I can tell you for sure, uh, the budget that was been approved uh, after that incident, it was triple X. So if, if X was the kind of an amount that was been approved uh, before the incident, the management literally understood those concerns from these kind of cyber incidents and the technical controls that we proposed to the management. I, I can literally say that triple X was the budget that was been approved after that incident. So it is only the way that how you convince uh, these terms to your management, how you bring these kind of concerns or highlights to your management, then you get those budgets approval. Uh, the last factor is the collaboration. Uh, I believe people here would be, uh, especially from the manufacturing, can understand this term. Sorry for that. Collaboration is nothing but how uh, we can say teams within an organization works in such kind of an incidents. Uh, if you talk about specifically a manufacturing plant, Engineering people uh, may be having a different mindset, but yes, uh, being an IT person, you need to get into those mindsets. You need to make them understand what are the key concerns, because if you really want to drive those solutions across your organization, collaboration plays a vital role within that. So that are the kind of an key takeaways uh, for me from that particular entire incident and also maybe for the audience who has joined today. Uh, awareness, budget and collaboration. Guys, just remember this ABC. This will really play an important role within your current organization or maybe for the college students who have joined also. Uh, these are the key things uh, when you go to an organization that needs to be taken care of. Awareness, as I said, now security needs to be inbuilt within the culture of the people. Until uh, security is there within the culture of the people, this kind of an incidents are going to happen. So now uh, talking about how uh, IIC 62443 certification has been helping in my current role. Uh, so people who are not familiar, uh, IIC 62443 is an horizontally accepted standard across the critical sector. So just to give a background for critical sector, people who are not aware, there are around 14 critical sectors that are being defined. Uh, as I said, uh, the light from electricity that comes to your home to food, gas, oil and gas, uh, and we can say, uh, the water, all this comes under a critical sector. So across these 14 critical sectors, IC 62443 uh, is the widely accepted standard as been developed by the International Society of Automation. So that is really helping us. Uh, if you work across any of these sectors, uh, you, you, you are going to use this kind of standards. IIC and uh, 62443 and the NIST are the two major standards that have been referred across the organization. The second point of here, uh, so benchmark uh, within the standards are again the same. If you talk about NIST and IIC, uh, there are a few of the controls that are again common. Uh, especially talking about security by design was never into manufacturing, was never into critical infrastructure sector. But if you see the cyber threat landscape that has changed from last four or five years, now that is really a concern. Uh, I would just like to highlight a few of the incidents that happened. Uh, we can say within the past one or two years within India itself. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many are aware regarding the or, or read regarding the recent railway incident uh, that literally killed more than 160 or 170 people within India, the south of India. Uh, and it is also believed that railway sector or, or the transport sector also been part of this critical sector. Again, there are uh, industrial control systems uh, that comes uh, uh, if they are been tampered. So uh, during the initial investigation, it has been also said that uh, there, there are a few signs of tampering where this, uh, that, that someone has tampered those kind of uh, signals also. And if you talk about one of the other incident uh, during the COVID time, uh, if, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, during the same October or November time period, uh, I'm not wrong, uh, entire Mumbai, uh, the capital of, uh, we can say the financial capital of India, had a blackout. When, as, when we say and blackout and uh, electricity going down across the region and just imagine the kind of an impact that it has across the medical facilities, across the people's person's life. So it is also been believed as per initial, uh, uh, we can say analysis. It was uh, been also said that there were third parties that tampered uh, within the electricity sectors uh, that we had due to which that incident happened. But yeah, that was nothing that has been out. But yeah, it is also believed that there was some tampering that happened into that. So you can correlate how these industrial control systems are being now key within every person's life and why security now been playing a key role uh, within this entire infrastructure. Uh, 
coming to uh, now the third point, uh, uh, being into a product company like uh, ours, uh, 62443 is now playing a major role because again, 62443 has various standards and reports that are being referred for doing various kind of risk assessment uh, for aligning our products that we are making uh, to the various industry standards. As I said, security was never by design into those products, but now organizations have started working towards security. So that is really helping me now when when I'm uh, when I'm already having this certification uh, to align those kind of and controls in layman languages to my architects, where we need to build up on security within the existing products that we have. And if you really talk about the last point, uh, the regulatory requirement, uh, as I said, the SEC, uh, you can just search it out. I believe US has just introduced that uh, uh, we can say requirement or regulatory requirement. Uh, it is again from their SEBI, uh, we can say similar to SEBI. Uh, US having their own, uh, we can say, exchange authority, which has uh, also introduced this kind of an incident reporting, cyber incident reporting, if anything is going wrong. And if you talk about NIST 2, this is the new regulatory requirement uh, coming across Europe. So if you just imagine Europe having uh, 26 plus countries, I believe, uh, will be having this kind of an requirements where if such kind of an cyber incidents happen uh, to the various critical sectors that are part of that NIST 2, uh, food and beverage being one of one of them. Sorry for that. So we need to report any such incidents back to the government agencies. That is a regulatory requirement. And when anything comes as a regulatory requirement, it, it really applies to every organization within that particular sector. And we need to comply to that because if you are not complying, there are huge amount of fines that are being, uh, we can say, uh, imposed on an organization that we are liable to pay. Uh, if you talk about uh, CCOP, this is uh, also the regulatory requirement in uh, Singapore, which has already started, I believe, from this month itself. It is also uh, on the similar lines to 62443. So this is why uh, we can say 62443 is really important now as an horizontally accepted standard across the organization, how it can help you guys to build up uh, your careers, uh, because now organizations have started asking for certifications, asking, uh, looking for people who knows these particular standards. And I believe this is the last slide for today. Yep. So would be happy to take. Hope it was not too fast, not too slow. Hope I was able to convey the story that I really wanted to talk about. Yeah, that was excellent uh, presentation, Ravindra. So, uh, uh, Ravindra, Thank if I so may uh, start, uh, this is Suresh Patil. Uh, so, the, the, the presentation and the information was really uh, great and very much helpful. Uh, hope I am audible. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for the nice presentation. Uh, I just have one question if you can help to understand. Uh, the the phishing email which was sent, so what kind of script it was having which, uh, uh, because of which the credentials were leaked. So do you have any idea? Uh, as I said, uh, if, if I really understand your concern, uh, I've highlighted it was the procurement team member, uh, which was the just using our own, uh, we can say, asset of the organization. Uh, though that uh, phishing email bypassed the technical control. Uh, so if I talk about the technical control, we were having an email filtering solution put in place at the perimeter itself. But yeah, if you, if you talk about nowadays, uh, there are a lot of uh, phishing ways that are being drafted which bypasses these technical solutions. And that was the one that hitting one of the employee and the employee clicking on that uh, link and then giving out his own credentials to the threat actors. Okay. okay. So, if, so uh, if, you, if you want to talk about, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so just to add, if you, if you see the latest Google uh, search also, fraud GPT, worm GPT are the latest GPT trends also, where these are also been used by the threat actors to craft we can say phishing mails, which which would really look like very genuine emails that are coming from some legitimate people. So it's technology is both side, right? Uh, it's we can say two side of the coin. Uh, it, it's been used for good side also, and it's been used for the bad side also. But yes, threat actors using it for the other side, and that is how uh, normal people or we can say techie people also getting uh, clicking on such kind of a link, and then their credentials getting compromised. 
Okay, okay, thanks. No, I was basically looking at uh, because I uh, remember one case wherein the uh, script uh, uh, was basically to uh, uh, to sort of un, um, uh, communicate the keystrokes uh, to the hacker, so through which they could get the credentials. So uh, I just wanted to understand if that sort of script was there or. As you said, it was just a bypass of the. No, no, it was it was it was just an phishing mail. So let me let me just drill down the exact mail. Okay. So the mail was drafted kind of an uh, your credentials are going to expire. Click on the link to renew your credentials. So being a genuine employee, if, if something something comes looking like an uh, mail from the organization itself, because they craft it in such a way that. Uh, normal employee also gets, uh, we can say, clicking on that link. It, it was just kind of a link to him, like mm -hmm. your credentials are going to expire and you need to renew your credentials. So that's how his credentials are already being given to that particular third party uh -huh. and they were able to access. Understood, understood. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Ravindra. Really a nice session. And thanks, yes, IFA, thank also for organizing this. Hello. Uh, question, yeah. more questions please yeah uh, my question is about uh, ceo mail that spam which had a, a problem a few months few years back any uh, blockages or any things designed to counter the ceo mail fraud where uh, all the legitimate mails uh, a ceo mail is hacked and uh, he sends the the frauds are sent from the ceo mail itself or the I main management mails itself. Yeah, so just to highlight on that, it is something called as a business email compromise, BC uh, in technical terms, where a fraudster, if he's able to get credentials of a management guy, or he tries to, uh, we can say, uh, fish an employee by saying that he's someone from a management and then asking him favors, in terms of uh, sending some amount to any third party or sending some amount to any third party accounts. So those are specifically called as a business email compromise. But yeah, in such cases, it usually happens that if there are no MFS be been enabled for those management people, uh, it might be also a chance that your credentials of your management are all already been compromised or someone been acting uh, in, in uh, term of an uh, management because we usually down employees do not cross and back to our management employees. Like if, if a mail comes from my CEO or CIO asking for me to do a favor, I would not question back him, right? Asking that why you're asking me to do this favor. Because I, I will imagine that it is a mail coming from an uh, top management and I need to respond back as per the request that he has sent it across without genuinely, genuinely checking those details. Uh, that is usually the way that has been taken by the threat actors also. Mm -hmm. So uh what you uh, what is the solution for that is mf filters right what i said so mostly organization has this mfa uh this is not a filter this is a multi-factor authentication so if you are using your banking app also right now a otp comes when you're doing a transaction so this mm -hmm. is a similar kind of an uh, multi-factor authentication not a single factor of authenticating yourself where in person along with his credentials need to supply something else also like an otp like an key or something that he has it with itself. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Hi, Hi Raj. Rajendra. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, Abhinay. Okay, Ravindra, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask one thing. Uh, your incidents, uh, there was a thing so that uh, the SOC team was silenced, like, how did that happen? Uh, the people were, the hackers were actually in the system and they were running scripts. They were trying those scripts. So uh, how did it happen that not even a single alert triggered from the soft team? Yeah, thanks for that question. I believe uh, I did not want it to bother the other audience. So I did not drill down into that technical details. But yeah, it was PS execute. You can just make a note of that. Uh, that was the tool that they used to run, uh, we can say, scripts uh, within that VDI server. 
so that uh, we can say tool has not been uh, raised as an alert so i've been also leading that sock operations within my earlier organization though we have uh, we can say around 120 around devices that were been integrated within the sock it again depends upon the various use cases and the threat thresholds that have been set across so it's not like a normal event would also get been alerted by the sock there are various use cases if you are from a sock team uh, there are various use cases that have been configured and that comes with an own threshold so until that threshold is been reached that is nothing that gets uh, raised as an alert to your sock team members so hope i am able to answer your question yes sir thank you for that and could you just repeat the execute script that you mentioned ps ps execute okay and how do we mitigate this uh, so uh, yeah yeah so we can block that via the we can say the uh, control policies from a domain controller what kind of an tools can be run within an environment so hardening thing can be done but yeah again uh, it's also been used for genuine purposes also by the administrators so it's i will not suggest first do an uh, a kind of a risk exploration within your environment if those tools are been really used by your uh, admin people and if you can uh, how we can accommodate into that Okay, thank you, Ravindra. Any other questions? Yeah, this is Rohini here. Can I ask a question now? I am not sure yes, whether yes. I'm late. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ravindra. First of all, thank you very much. It was really great uh, presentation. And the way you have covered, no, the sequentially, we could visualize the whole story. I, it was really very good. Okay, uh, my question is a, a kind of a, like an admin question that uh this cyber insurance whether we have to have a cyber insurance or it can come under force major condition under the contract like what, so, what is your uh, viewpoint on this yeah so uh, it as i said the, as part of one of the risk management activities uh so if you talk about how risk are being mitigated within an organization either it is accepted either it is we can say cleaned off either it is been transferred so there are three or four steps from a risk management perspective most of the organizations, uh, they took uh, kind of an uh, cyber insurance as we do for our medical insurance also, right? Though uh, we knowing that something would not happen, but from a prevention perspective, we better go for an uh, cyber insurance or in a medical insurance. So it's the same way, uh, depending upon the organization, how critical it is. Uh, but as I, as I rightly pointed out now, cyber insurance companies also do a lot of checks uh, before just insuring yourself. It is the similar way that when you are going to take a medical insurance, you need to go through a lot of medical test histories and that you need to submit to, to the insurance company in a similar way. Okay, but does any contract allows you like as a force major condition or you have to have that like, I mean, depending on the risk analysis? Uh, it, it, again, depends, but... No, it, it depends. It depends on the risk analysis of the organization and um, how that organization is really uh, needed to have that kind of an insurance in place. Because if you have the compensating controls within an organization, it is not needed. But yeah, if, if uh, from, an, from an entire uh, defense in depth perspective, I believe that is the term that we use within every organization. If there are few missing gaps within the organization, it's better to have an uh, cyber insurance kind of thing in person because that amount can really help an organization to recur. No, actually, my question is coming from a EPC environment point where maybe uh, I'm not talking about the organization, the IT, uh, wherever suppose we are giving some uh, projects delivered to the end user and uh, maybe once commissioned or whatever your contract period over operation period, we hand it over to client. So in that way, uh, my question is insurance um, may help only for the during until we uh, deliver the project. But after that, basically, it's not like our product, it, it is like an end user. Yes, yes. So uh, in that specific cases, I have seen that usually the organization taking those kind of an, uh, decisions, whether that they really need an cyber insurance or not. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you, ICT yep. as well, for this organizing wonderful presentation. Thanks once again. Uh, Any more questions? Ravindra, this is Sandeep Shiroff here. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, you are audible. Ravindra, first of all, congratulations for excellent uh, uh, session. And 
i would actually want to ask you like what are the general uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of learning or general kind of uh, care one needs to take for so as an ot uh, because all of us are from the ot area so like while providing a new ot solution or providing a new ot uh, uh, softwares Uh, what are the things that we should take care, and what are the things that, uh, in terms of like defense in depth models and all those kind of things that one need to. So, what can you give some little bit of idea about uh, the security? Because that is one of the generally still like in OT front, it is still a, not a kind of a very uh, what I will say the savvy thing. Not not in the right sense, but I mean, it is not a must. What we generally people put this requirements at the last. Is that fine? Yes. 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 So that's the kind of an assurance that now customers also needs. Uh, we've been also uh, within the similar kind of an industry. So what I can say that uh, as as I highlighted within my presentation also, security was never by design into industrial control systems. If you see five years back or ten years back, and if you see those solutions, uh, yeah, it is hard to have security controls built in built into those kind of an solutions, legacy solutions. I can say. But if you see uh, now, if you are working on any any new solutions, that is where uh, IIC also recommend uh, recommends four dash one or four dash two, or aligning it to the three dash three kind of an system security requirements. Mm -hmm. And as per the various security levels also that uh, IIC has, uh, you can align your products at what particular security level that you can meet your product can meet, because that can give an assurance to the customers also that whatever I am purchasing, it is already having two kind of an controls put in place. uh it is a similar thing uh, that uh, we go with any cloud vendor also nowadays i believe from an it perspective that uh, if you are if you are signing anything with a third party or a new contract from a cloud vendor or a cloud saas solution specifically uh, we specifically check uh, it comes with their own assurance certificates uh, like uh, if you talk about the major ones like sap or salesforce uh, they have uh, we can say assurance certificates where they clearly say that product has been aligned to this particular certification where uh, those controls are already been inbuilt within their products or solutions that they are selling it across so i believe that is the kind of an thing now uh, industrial control uh, uh, we can say integrator system integrators product owners need to also need to work across uh, that i have seen across where 6244 3 4-1 3-3 we need to align our products to those certifications at a particular level so that that can give an assurance to the customers also that yes uh, uh, there are few controls from a security perspective that are already aligned within our products hope uh, i am able to answer your question sir uh, ravindra uh, if you allow can i speak uh, something on this thing yep yep would be happy amit thanks for joining uh, nice to see a lot of isc people and my old colleagues also here so, uh, so uh, i just want to mention two more things uh, in a easy language Uh, to answer sandeep uh, query also sandeep uh, basically uh, look at from this entire environment from multiple angles uh, multiple triangles i will say one is uh, secure what you have so whatever your environment ot environment it environment you have any integration any kind of third party remote access first of all your priorities should be secure what you have uh, i will give you another analogy like covid so if i don't want to get infected with covid i'll put two masks three masks i'll try to you know uh, try to you know, defend defense in depth so i'll put some kind of defense and i'll not go outside so try to put your yourself into that mode first secure what you have second one is vigilant vigilant basically you keep an eye on your environment 24 by 7 now in this case ravi's uh, environment they were having sock um, at at least it was a it sock Uh, maybe with some uh, ot capabilities uh, try to uh, put yourself onto the vigilant mode so keep an eye on your environment 24 by 7 your ot and it both of them and make it better than yesterday 
SOC will be having a lot of discrepancies. It may not be that intelligent and try to bring more and more intelligence that you, you detect uh, any kind of malware, ICS malware or IT uh, side of a ransomware, those things get. Third one is resilient. Tomorrow, if an attack happens, how soon you can come back to your uh, normal position? So resilient, basically, in this case, uh, Ravi mentioned that their online backups were corrupted, offline backups were not tested, those kind of things. So resilient, now again, in uh, from the COVID point of view, we, uh, from the vigilant point of view, COVID, you, I, I do my checkup every 15 days or every one month uh, kind of thing. And then resilient is basically, if tomorrow an attack happens on me, how, how soon I can recover from that, that attack. So you can put this thing. Another triangle I want to mention, which Ravi was also mentioning, uh, product security, system security, and network security. All those three are holistic will be. So for, for all those things, ISA 62443 has certifications. So for product security, they have um, at least uh, four different certifications, CSA, SDLA, SSA, and ICSA. One more is also coming up, uh, five actually. And then you have to take care of your system security, uh, level 0, uh, 1, 2 which is having SSA by ISA 62443 and network security, all your data coming from OT, getting transferred to the IT via different, uh, via either wired network or wireless networks, WiMAX, some people use VSAT and all that. So you can use this uh, tra strategy. So secure, vigilant, resilient, and COVID analogy will help you to beat this strategy. Uh, uh, th thanks, um, uh, Sandeep sir, Musla sir. Mm, but I will still uh, see this is more related towards the IT point of view, but still like there are a lot of embedded products or the actual instruments which are there lying in the field, like having an embedded server connectivity, direct exposure kind of thing, embedded devices. What is that you would suggest for such kind of manufacturers or such kind of uh products because like pura is a market full for that kind of i mean instrument manufacturer and uh, still that awareness regarding to this aspect is lagging at the embedded systems development level embedded is uh see look at uh, uh, embedded systems is there since many years and iot is nothing but connected embedded systems if we see from the product uh, perspective Embedded is having all the way hardware to cloud uh, uh, stuffs. So people are doing hardware hacking. They are uh, there are JTAG interface, UART interface. You can communicate with the embedded system. You can extract absolutely, the absolutely. You can, you that, can that do is the, the changes kind of... in the firmware. You can put it back. You can uh, you so... can play with, play with the certificates. Uh, so hardware, firmware, web app, thick clients, thin clients, wireless protocols, wired wired protocols. All of them are having different uh, attack vectors. So you have to look at from the, that's what I mentioned, the another triangle, product security, system security, and network security. So your product, your entire house will be secure when your each and every brick inside the house is uh, secure. So your embedded components also need to be given uh, security attention. And that's what this ISA has four different types of certifications, which you should think of on ISA's website. You can see uh, what all the companies have developed. Uh, I mean, got these certification. They are into the levels. So you can. It's a deep, deep topic, and uh, you can always look into that that angle as well. Thanks, uh, Ravi, for allowing me to chip in. Continue, please. Hey, no issues. Thank you, Amit. Uh, yeah. So just to add on that, uh, Sandeep sir. So if I really understand your concern, as rightly been highlighted by Amit also. Uh, defense in depth plays a major role from an organization's perspective. And, but from an, uh, we can say product seller perspective, uh, as I highlighted, awareness plays a major role. Uh, if you have seen across the major vendors, uh, vendors like Rockwell, Snyder Electric, and the other ones in the market, uh, uh, we can say highlighting vulnerabilities. Uh, if you see back five years, that was not such thing happening from these industrial vendors also. But now due to this entire threat landscape that has been changed, uh, you see, uh, we can say vulnerabilities that get highlighted by these top vendors also. So I believe in the similar manner as now it's been having a real impact on the real life of the people. If you talk about critical sectors, that's why uh, every global organization, uh, every nation is now trying to see it from a cybersecurity concern perspective of how these uh, threats can be real uh, to the cyber physical systems. 
So that's how we can uh, make those controls from an organization perspective and from a product perspective or from a company selling those products, how we can assure our customers that whatever components or whatever products that they are they're planning to buy from us, it is having those controls put in place, at least from a secure design perspective. So as I said, secure by design was never into the products. Uh, we can say uh, design phase itself, but now aligning it to 62443, 4-2 or 4-1, we need to make sure those kind of controls are put in place. Yes. Thanks, Ravindra, for this uh, kind of because that that was one area which I felt like I wanted to highlight it because uh, people generally are taking care of everything at the IT level, but at the embedded space level, this was one of the things which is not really being discussed at length. And if people feel, uh, and, uh, by this, uh, in this session also, I wanted to highlight that this is one of the biggest threat area or vulnerability area which is there, which is not yet been explored. And uh, there are a lot of loopholes which are there at this level, like people are becoming uh, IoT savvy or IT savvy kind of connectivity, they are asking for it. but. If the solutions, embedded solutions are not that foolproof, then you are an easy uh, scapegoat uh, through which uh, this kind of uh, attack could happen to the networks. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Any other questions? Any Anyone other questions? Hello, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. My name is Anikhil. So actually, I had, yeah, a, uh, yeah, I had a question that uh, uh, you explained exactly on the topic as the, three, uh, the attack has happened on about 3.5 level of audio model, right? So did it that uh, did the ransomware spread on the below level of like uh, after 3.5 level for like level? No, 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 no. So to answer that, that you. Yeah, that would have made a havoc. So the reason. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, if you if you really talk about uh, uh, level three point five and above, also uh, we have Windows based system. You, you you would agree to that. And if you visit a plant shop floor, also uh, Windows seven and Windows XP are still common. And within every manufacturing plant, I can also say that uh, the other concerns are that these are flat networks. Uh, network segmentation is not not that clean within every organization. So that are also the reasons where this kind of a lateral movement happened from an IT to OT. And if those are Windows based systems, then it really has an impact on your Windows based system. Uh, but even if the uh, IT systems are above 3.5, the systems are of uh, Windows 7 and Windows below 7, then that is that is a mistake. But if they are like uh, below, like uh, the attack has happened on uh, below 3.5 level, then uh, I had to consider like for more questions because uh, yeah, that was the point. I agree, but uh, I believe if you have read about uh, the recent attack, uh, other can you go on mute? I believe there's a lot of disturbance in the back end. Uh, so just to answer, if you have read about Triton attack, uh, which targeted the safety PLC systems, uh, you can really see those kind of scenarios happening or real world examples where such kind of an attacks have already happened on level 3.5 and below. So though it was not a direct ransomware attack, but yes, cyber attack, uh, such kind of an cyber attacks are been possible if an um, threat actor is really into an environment. And if you talk about level 3.5 and above also, there are critical servers like CDAS servers, MES servers, which are really having a lot of data from your production environments. And if that is getting impacted within a manufacturing environment uh, from, from a uh, ransomware attack like this, it is really going to have an impact on your manufacturing plant. Right. That is how it has been correlated. Excellent answer, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome, Ranjit. Yeah, can I ask? Yeah, Shamraj, go on. Yeah, Ravi, thank you, sir, for this uh, for this highlighting session. It was like very enlightening, and I would say like I would watch it like a documentary. So <laughs> I was wondering, that. like, yeah, yeah, I was wondering, like, now how the Mexican, like, that Mexican. You have office at Mexico, so those uh, laptops or devices were also 
uh, <clears throat> encrypted by the ransomware so how were your people able to access it like i had one question is this one no, second so, question yeah yeah, one, yeah, I, yeah. One, yeah. one more question i'll ask okay. and i'll it, drop okay. so second question so question is like how difficult like i see like many it people are trying to shift to security also mm-hmm. uh, they are trying to get into ot security which is like a new uh, hype there is so much hype uh, surrounding the uh, ot security side so how difficult it is to get into that because you already are from that background thank you okay uh, so thanks for those questions so to answer your first question uh, as you rightly highlighted uh, and as i i believe uh, i told within my session also uh, those laptops have been running on windows 7 so we all know though windows 7 is end of support uh, still organizations for the organizations are using that and uh, what we did was that uh, when we got an call from those i it manager we took a remote session uh, on a team viewer or or can say an approved uh, remote access software and we took an uh, session of that particular system and that ir third party was able to do a dump and enter registry of that system uh so when they dumped that and then they were able to find out that entire uh, exact script uh, which was the kind of a root cause uh, which has been inserted within the active directory server now shifting to your next question uh how an it person can move into ot i believe it was a similar challenge for me uh, we can say four years back down the line but at that time there was no such materials or no such kind of an courses i have that was readily been available but if you see nowadays there are a lot of uh, uh, open source or online materials that have been available i would also like to highlight iic pune chapter being uh, really doing a good work into this particular area and there are a lot of certifications from iic also that you you can do it yourself and apart from that i believe there are also many free courses that have been available uh, for an uh, entirely new person uh, from an it or ot field to get into or to understand what ot is all about uh ics cert is having their own online modules uh, you can search it, search it across uh, or we can you can just ping me across on whatsapp or the social media i can give you that exact links hope that answers your question so much yeah thank you so much and keep sharing the knowledge ravindra thank you excellent presentation uh i am vijay jaju speaking uh, hey, you said one thing that uh, entire online backup was corrupt corrupted and then offline backup was used to restore so after this incidents uh what was the frequency for uh, offline backup taking the offline backup uh, was there any changes made to get the offline backup yeah so so if you really want uh, if i want to really talk about that concern offline backup as i said uh, it comes with their own cost uh, and maintenance that you need to do so it again depends upon the organization uh, some organizations only do it for their critical systems while some organization plan to do it for the rest also but yeah in that case you need to also consider the cost additional cost that you need to bear uh, when if you are planning for an offsite backup so that was the kind of an learning okay thanks it it depends upon an risk based approach uh, if we are really having those three critical assets uh, and and the likelihood of those getting corrupted again is and more then you decide uh, your compensating controls on that okay thanks that's great i think uh, we might have come to the end of our session if there are any more questions we can take one or two questions quick questions hi This is Ishwar from Japan. Uh, it was wonderful right. session. Thank you so much. Uh, can you please quickly highlight some points? If in which case the insurance is uh, unclaimable, like any cases, if you are aware or you can give our awareness. Uh, especially talking about maybe and cyber insurance company can give you more details on that. Uh, but latestly, I have seen uh, now uh, Active Directory as I highlighted. Uh, one of the major concern kind of an acting as an uh, uh, we can say common uh, identity and authentication across your it and ot systems uh, one of the recommendation was from the cyber insurance to have a separate ad uh, for the ot environment so i believe now they also evaluate a lot of uh, controls from a cyber security perspective uh, that are rare for organization 
that are there within an organization. So it depends upon an organization because they also involve some cyber third parties to do an entire evaluation and then suggest uh, the kind of an amount that can be paid back. That that was the kind of an example that I, I have gone through, but maybe a cyber insurance person can give in more detail, uh, like what are the valid ones which are allowed or which are the valid ones which are not allowed. Thank you so much. Uh, we need to submit the forensics evidence or they will conduct the forensics separately. How is no, no, we, we need to submit and I believe that was one of the uh, we can say learning for us also because they wanted and uh, big four to do an entire cyber forensic analysis uh, in the mid because uh, when uh, we involved that third party that was not an big four uh, because we all know it comes with their own cost uh, but again uh, that cyber forensic from and big four got into and then a uh, few of the cyber forensic evidences were also not been available. Uh, because until that time, already the restoration and the other activities as per the dependencies were already started. So that was again a catch from that uh, cyber insurance company. But I believe, yeah, that would not be the same across. But yeah, that is how they also try to see uh, whether, like if you go for a medical insurance also, they try to check what, what are your existing health uh, conditions, what are the existing health checkups that you have done, and if you're uh, sending those kind of documents. So that is the kind of a cross validation that they do, I believe. Thank you so much, Ravindra. That's great. So, rounding up, uh, I, I mean, before I hand over for the vote of thanks, uh, I would also like to personally thank you, Ravindra ji, for a great, excellent uh, session. And uh, this was one of the most uh, knowledge based uh, session, which I think uh, is shown that, you know, so many uh, participants are still there attending to the question and answer uh, uh, session, although the time is, you know, uh, from 11 to 12, but the still, you know, the, the interest is seen from the participation. Now, I would like to hand over uh, the uh, stage to Mr. Sandeep Kulkarni. He is our uh, education chair and he would be giving the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, Gurmit. Uh, thanks. I'm, uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Ravindra. Uh, uh, it was a uh, very nice session. It was excellent session. It was like a storytelling uh, and everyone was engrossed into, uh, you know, your narration uh, it, it, and it was full of uh, uh, real life incidents. That's why, you know, it was very much, uh, um, uh, you know, people were feeling that, you know, uh, it, it is something, you know, they may uh, have to incur some time in the future. If not, uh, I, I hope they don't. But then, you know, we need to be, uh, you know, ensure uh, their infrastructure be uh, secure. And uh, as you correctly said, the ISS 62443 is something, you know, which uh, helps organizations. Uh, Jaju, sir, can you please mute? Uh, so uh, something uh, you know, uh, this ISA IC six two double four three standard, which uh, has a four models, we, which really helps you to actually uh, build uh, the uh, industrial cyber security or the OT cyber security culture into the organization. And uh, you know, uh, as 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 uh, Ravindra, uh, you uh, correctly said that uh, you know the, there is a huge importance nowadays for the implementation of the cyber security measures uh, its continuous monitoring and the continuous improvement is something you know very much essential uh, uh, to actually deal with the cyber threats uh, i i really thank you for such an engrossing session uh, you know uh, i I'll, I'll also take this opportunity because the topic is similar to actually announce that uh, we have a second batch of uh, ic 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 32 and 33 from 24 to uh, 20 uh, 24 to 30th august uh, we successfully had the biggest batch uh, in june uh, and due to the overwhelming demand we have to arrange for this uh, another batch uh, which uh, the people uh, i would urge to take uh, the benefit of uh, if anyone want to actually um, get enrolled into it uh, once again, thanks, Ravindra, for this uh, uh, wonderful session, uh, uh, and uh, I hope it's helpful for 
most of us who are present today. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Ravindra, sir, for this wonderful session. Thank you, guys. Thank you for, Thank the, you for the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ravindra, sir. Uh, Ravindra ji, just for your information and your permission, we, we have recorded this session. And if, uh, yeah. if you are okay with it, uh, we normally ha uh, host this on our ISA channel's YouTube channel. Yeah, sir. Would be, would be fine. Right? Because many people yes. miss it, uh, typically, you know. So it's available then, you know, for the knowledge of other people. Yes, yes, sir. Would be happy. Right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, sir.